pets and just to choose the elephant. They come near them and eat them up. They will, they can't, they can't, can't eat them. Oh, I see. What was yours called, Meg? Your, your animal okay. that you made? Um, a flesh-eating dinosaur. A flesh-eating dinosaur. And yours was a leaf-eating dinosaur. Mm. I decided to head it into a flesh-eating dinosaur. Great big. Well, no, shall I tell you a story not. about animals? Mm. Yes. Well, now, listen very carefully. This isn't just a children's story. There's much more to it than that. The story dates from the 13th century, and it's really what this program is all about. Once upon a time, there was a lion who lived in a forest. And he got very so he thought he'd have a drink of water. So he went to the forest and then he found a pool of water and he looked in it. And then he saw, as he thought, another lion looking back out of the water. Why was that? Because it was him. Yes, but he didn't know because he was rather a silly lion. So he said, ah, which means get out of the water and want a drink. He said that to another lion. It wasn't another lion at all, so it couldn't get out of the and water. And did you know what lion say, ah? The other lion didn't say anything. It was a reflection. Yes, it's a reflection. So all the other animals in the forest gathered round and they started to laugh at this lion because they could all see what it was. And the giraffe laughed, and the elephant laughed, and even the butterfly laughed. <laughs> a little laugh like that. Suddenly, the lion got so thirsty, he said to himself, I don't care. Who's in that water? I'm going to have a drink. His head down into it, and he found there wasn't another lion there at all. He could have a lovely, cool drink of water. And that's how the lion learned something that we can all learn that you shouldn't be afraid of something which you don't understand. You must find out what it is, you see. <laughs> There is an old saying, man is asleep, must he die before he wakes up? I want to show you some examples of the things I feel keep all of us dream walking. We all think of ourselves as logical people, people who are capable of changing our minds, for instance, if we get superior information, more information which tells us that our former beliefs or prejudices were untrue. Doctor. Ward Edwards of the University of Michigan Engineering Psychology Laboratory has disproved this in a most alarming manner. He has shown that one third of people are not able to change their minds once they have made them up on the basis of inaccurate information, even if accurate information is subsequently given to them. Now, what is your name? Um, Nicholas Rebecca. Paul Nicholas Ravy. How old are you? Five and... Just five? Just mm. had a birthday? Not just five. Um, oh. Five and two days. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Well, now we're going to look at some of these things. Here. And look at them. See what their names are. This is a... Racket. Racket. Mm. And... And a saw. A saw. Kangaroo. Kangaroo. Effluent. What was that? Effluent. What are these? Bananas. Ba? Bananas. Bananas. At the moment, this little boy still uses wrongly learnt names for one or two objects. He agrees that they're wrong and that it is illogical to persist. Eventually, he will put it right. But adults lose the honesty and vitality of children and often settle into lives full of contradictions. I had an interesting example of this not long ago when I was listening to the Jimmy Savile show on radio. Jimmy Savile asked his audience whether there was anybody who objected to the presence of immigrants in this country, and if so, why? And a lady stood up and said, yes, I do. And Jimmy Savile said, why? And she said, because they're going to crowd us out. There are going to be more and more of us, uh, and of them, and there won't be any room for all of us. So Jimmy Savile said, does anybody have anything to say to that? And another man stood up and said, I have the figures here. 
emigration from this country is much greater than immigration. And we're likely to be less people here rather than more. So the lady's point is wrong. Jimmy Savile said to the lady, what have you got to say to that? And she said, I don't believe it. Too often we are unaware of the way we disregard inconvenient information. Too often we are quite unconscious of the true origins of our behavior. Labels can very often be more effective than reasons. There's a story in this paper about it. People often make decisions, decisions which will cost them money on the basis of irrational evidence. The Ford Motor Company carried out an experiment in which they got a bunch of hard-bitten Ford Motor dealers and they asked them to make an offer for a used car. The highest offer they got was 150 pounds. Then the Ford people put a couple of labels under the bonnet and they sprayed the upholstery with the smell of fresh leather and they called the dealers in again. And this time, the car was snapped up for 230 pounds. 80 pounds for a smell of leather and a couple of labels of not very great value. The moral is that many of our decisions are triggered off by stimuli, by things like labels. These stimuli make us do things which we haven't thought out at all. We are all conditioned, and mostly we're unaware of the ways we've been trained to react. Looks like a game of hide and seek, doesn't it? Now watch the same scene with different music. Most of our assessments are made unconsciously. Pat Williams, South African writer. Well, it was a great shock to me to discover that I could be, in fact, conditioned without knowing that I could be. And in fact, <clears throat> to be conditioned in such a way that what my real feelings were were absolutely the opposite to what I had thought they were, my opinion about what I thought. I was brought up in South Africa where one is conditioned from the cradle into having a certain attitude towards black people. One sees them round one as inferior people one is told that they are and the whole organization of society makes it quite clear that these people are different and less than white people now it seemed to me very young that this was ridiculous and i grew up to be somebody who thought they had no color prejudice at all and in line with that thought i took an awful lot of political and social risks i know for example that I had been noticed quite often by the police and had a file, which is a risk, though not a big one. Um, I took stances and said things and wrote things which were in line with my not having any colour prejudice at all. And what's more, I um, broke the law and had black friends, but it was all in the framework of an idea that I thought this law was bad and I never examined myself to see if I really felt that way. I kept it right out of awareness. Then one day I left South Africa, this is the interesting bit, and I went to a country where there was no colour prejudice, there was no framework to hold me so I could have my opinion opposite. And um, I went into a shoe shop to buy a pair of shoes and a black man served me. Now this was the first contact in my whole life, and by then I was 24, which was a non-racial contact which had nothing to do with me deciding that this was going to happen. And as that man came and fitted the shoe on my foot, I felt my whole body begin to shake because this was a free contact. And I had to force myself to see what I'd been hiding from myself before, which was in fact, I was conditioned, not in the place I could easily get at, which was my opinions in my head, but in my very body. And until I acknowledged that, and it was a painful acknowledgement, I couldn't begin to try and exorcise it from myself. The people who can be got at are the normal people. Yes. You are normal because you do accept a large amount of the teeniness of the 
people among, uh, among which you live. Dr. William Sargent is head of psychological medicine at St. Thomas's Hospital. He is well known for his special study of conditioning and unconscious brainwashing. I've no doubt at all that suppose Hitler had conquered England and Hitler had then run uh, all the public schools and all the secondary education, that perhaps 70% of the new generation in England could have been brought up with Hitlerite viewpoints. But although the normal people are uh, get atable, there are always in the population a group of people who are either mad or near mad or what we call obsessive who can't be got at by these techniques. So we have an interesting situation of paradox, really. Yes, and, but, but it is these people who are not going to accept the group indoctrination that are going to make the great advances. I mean, Newton I mean, had to go on believing for many years against all comers that gravity was not God, so to speak, although he was prepared to admit gravity might be God, but that gravity moved at G plus 32. And he said in this respect that he wished to point out that if God was involved, God did move in D plus 32. Well, you see, he was one of these extraordinary people who really was a, a, a crackpot. His great interest was the prophecies of the book of Daniel, the I significance see. of the seven-headed beast and that sort of thing. And uh, he would spend 16 hours a day in his rooms at Trinity, going over and over this, this biblical prophecy. Now, he looked upon um, gravity as a mere sort of sideline. Well, the point I want to make is, that a person who may have quite mad ideas in one field can make a big discovery in another field. And this idea that you've got to put all your research money uh, onto very sane, normal, balanced people, you're going to get no results at all because a sane, normal and balanced person mostly believes what, it, what the group already believes. Already believes. It's not that we'd all become Isaac Newtons if we were less conformist, but we must surely come to realise that our desire to cooperate and our fear of being thought inadequate in trying circumstances okay. very often prevent us from seeing reality. Now, we have one more thing. We have two statements here. One was made with a child of below average IQ, and the other was made by a child with an above average IQ. And the first statement, below average, is children have a nice time because grown-ups have to deal with all the hard things, having to deal with naughty children going to bed. And the above average IQ child said, Maybe guinea pigs play hide-and-seek, but we don't know. Do they play? Do guinea pigs play games? I don't know. Maybe they play hide-and-seek, but we don't know. Do you like games? Now, in fact, both lots of statements came from my daughter, Syrah. They had been divided quite arbitrarily, and the object of our experiment was to see whether anyone would say that there was insufficient evidence to go on, or even to admit that they weren't personally qualified to judge IQ differences. Yes. And why do people have mummies and daddies? Well, well, people wouldn't be there if they didn't have mummies and daddies. Hmm, I see. People wouldn't be there if they didn't have mummies and daddies. People get bored if they don't play games. Now, what do you think about those two statements? Can you see the difference in their intelligence from their statements? And what do you... Why do you think there is a difference? Well, children wouldn't be there if they didn't have mummies and daddies, which is, I think, rather brilliant, because um, the child probably is thinking of being looked after mm -hmm. by her parents. Yes. Um, that's the above average. Well, that's the above average, mm -hmm. yes. yes. Um, well, I suppose a child gets bored with all work, schoolwork, and they like their games. Yes. And they feel that it's better for them. Yes. A below average child, um, Well, I think they're rather naughty, mm -hmm. and um, don't think about things a great deal. They just think what a trying time they're giving their parents. I see. And can you see that in the two different yes, things? You can yes, see that. Yes. It's quite clear. Yes. Well, the first child, of course, is obviously a bit mixed up. Um, thinks grown-ups have a nice time, and then associates that with hard, naughty children going to bed. Yes. Um, and the second child, the second child obviously understands the importance of mothers and fathers and, and not being bored. Uh, maybe he's got a guinea pig, I don't know where they play. Yeah, play hide and seek. Seek. Yes. And the attitudes, though, that's the understanding. Yeah. How about the attitudes towards things of the children of the two different IQs? 
Well, I suppose this, this particular first child associates things with grown-ups being always having a good time and naughty children. Uh, um, it seems a rather unhappy sort of situation. But, um, Say then that this child is less happy than that. I would child. have thought so, just uh -huh. reading that. Yeah. Yes. Um, this, obviously, the second child immediately associates his own being here with having a mother and father, mm -hmm. and um, being kept happy, not bored by playing games. Well, it seems to me too sophisticated. I see. So perhaps the test showed um, a difference between the two. Yes, but marked difference. It does. What was it? Who made the test and how? I see. So there is undoubtedly a difference. Yes. But the basis might be wrong. I would have thought, because this seems a, this seems a normal reaction, this seems a bit fancy. I see. So we, we, we have found a difference that we don't necessarily agree on the basis of the test. Yes, because uh, unless you know well, who was making the test. If we are awake to the reality of conditioning, we need not be disadvantaged by it. Hello. How are you? How are you? Well, not too good, you know. Okay. I've been, well, I've had bronchitis. Rituals. Most people think of rituals as something connected with religion or something bad. They use the word ritual and ritualistic to mean something, as we say, pejorative, something that they don't like very much. But ritual is increasingly coming to be understood as something which we all need in our life. In fact, we all practice rituals almost all the time. Rituals of greeting, rituals of buying and selling. Good afternoon, Mr. Sharp. Mm -hmm. How are you? Very well, thank you. And you? The form of words which we use when we meet people or when we say goodbye. Even the meals we have together, the whole family once a week or something like that. These have a ritualistic quality. Ritual is something which helps us to structure our lives. I've had a bit of bronchitis, you know, the last couple of weeks. Have you? I'm sorry to hear that. I didn't know. It's pretty awful. Yes. Really, but Miserable yeah. thing to have, especially with the nice weather. These are so weak, you know. Yes. How are you getting on with the new dialing thing? You know, people oh, having. Oh, very well. Are people learning how to use the? Yes, one uh, or two of the uh, uh, old age pensioners are finding it difficult mm. to master, but uh, it's very yes. much nicer, I think. Oh yes, I think it's easier it and it's much saves, quicker. Saves time, yes. Yes. Mm. yes. Can you tell me the airmail? That's really what I gave. Airmail rates to America have they have they changed lately? They? No, they're still the same. We've well, been talking about ritual. I'm sure people are going to gain the impression that one is against ritual it's got to be got rid of there's no, no. no I, don't think, I don't think it has to be got rid of um my father was an orthodox jew he used to love watching um um ceremonies in, in westminster abbey and things like that exactly, on television exactly uh, ritual has a kind of aesthetic value it has a kind of um intrinsic beauty like opera has but nobody believes that opera is really what life is about you no. know uh, well, yeah, it can have a yes. it, it's also, it also provides a kind of common ground. Yes, but we yes. mustn't be used by ritual. We must understand what it is. And take just as much as we need and no more. Take yeah. it or leave it. That's right. Many people get it. There's um, a very evident ritual in, in, let's say, the comic form, you know, that um, the chaplain, the small man, defying authority, um, is a ritual. It's a ritual the audience want to observe. The chaplain goes through it for them, or went through it for them, Keaton went through it for them. They were experiencing, experiencing it vicariously. probably kind of uh, like anarchy by proxy, you know, to kick a policeman up the arse in a sketch. I'm doing it on behalf of a lot of people who like to kick 
place than at the Aston. So in a sense, they've had that experience yes, by exactly. identifying with it. Yeah, and they yeah, know so something of what it's like. So I think it's true of a lot of comedy that uh, there's al almost inevitably um, most comics seem to work with against authority figures, um, violently against mm -hmm. authority figures. They're doing this really on behalf of the audience. Yes. Whether it's subconsciously, whether they're doing it consciously, is irrelevant. The audience wants to do those things, it wants to throw bricks through windows, it wants to shout and scream and tear its clothes off and you're doing it for them. You know? Does it want to do that, to, does the audience want to do that to release emotion because... Yes, I think so. Because the forms of um, yeah. release of emotion are not available. I think this is very true, I think that the current sort of skinhead phenomena um, is, is, is really, this, um, these people have no other forms of, of release for this kind of pent up feelings of violence, you know. Um, one doesn't approve it but one understands it. is the result of pent-up feelings, then we have to learn to identify those feelings in ourselves and in others before they reach flashpoint. Above all, we have to give one another more attention. Attention, the need for it, the need to give it and receive it, is a sort of nutrition. People crave attention, as we know. We all know people who want attention desperately badly. Children call out for a glass of water in the night when they don't really want a glass of water. They very often want attention. They want reassurance. But the basic thing is attention. People might say, well, animals attract attention or avoid attention or give one another attention, as for instance, you can see monkeys grooming one another. It's called grooming. And then they, so they might say, well, this attention thing is, after all, just a lower level sort of activity. Yes, it is. A lower level activity like uh, your heart beating and just a pump. But without it, you die. An animal is at the mercy of what attention he can get and what attention he can't get. We don't have to be. You can make it a matter of your own experiment, your own experience, that very often, if you find a person who is very excitable or who keeps on about something and you give him or her a lot of attention, you'll find that his views may become much less pronounced. He may become much calmer, a more interesting person. He may learn to give you attention too. And this is the basis of civilization. Not just culture, not cultivated behavior, but civilization. It's that important. The June trade figures are today at the worst. Good morning. Here's the forecast for the day until the In view of the fact that it's Friday, tonight's edition of Sound of the 70s is the last one of the week. The information we've had this morning. On the A38, it's single line at Coom Hill. That's between Hofstra and Tewksbury. Every day on Radio 1. Now, here's the show that already seems to Information which actually tells us striking facts about our own behavior pours out from everywhere. But how much of a newspaper, for instance, do we retain? Can you read the morning paper? Any morning paper? Yes. yes. Can you tell me what the big stories were? Um, well, first of all, uh, about the common market and uh, Anthony Barber going off and um, saying what his policy on the common market is going to be. What else? Secondly, um, Maudling going to Ulster to um, lay down the law about uh, rioting in London, really. But those are the two big stories. Um, Mr. Thorpe's wife being killed is another... The Liberal leader's uh, death of his wife. Yes. That, I fear, is all. I've been playing golf, so I haven't read an awful lot. Well, I can't say I can remember anything offhand now. Um, 
uh, the story about Jeremy Thorpe's wife being killed. That was a big article in most of them, I think. Um, sports pages. Trouble in Ireland. Um, Roger Saylor, fantastic win. Some fellas uh, won the tennis thing or something. And uh, Garth's having a hard time on the boat. It's all lies anyway, isn't it? Uh, but the main headlines... I don't know, where are they? I've so, so much been murdered or something. I sat down and read them there for 15 minutes while I was eating my breakfast in the sandal cup. As far as I can remember. We remember what touches us, what we recognise as interesting. We are looking for the familiar. We are poorly equipped even to recognise the new, let alone to use it. By and large, the new information passes straight through us to end up, perhaps, like this, pulped in a paper mill. Will our society go down in history as one which wasted almost all its knowledge? Now let's talk about learning. Now some very interesting research has been done on cats. You know how difficult cats are to teach and to train anything. Well, it's been discovered that if you get some cats and train them how to do something, and then you get some other cats, and have these second lot of cats watch the first lot performing their tricks or whatever they are, the second lot of cats will learn simply by watching. Now this has such far-reaching consequences that all the commonly accepted theories of learning and how the brain works in collecting information may have to be revised. It is quite possible that we may discover that by simply watching people do things we can learn which casts doubt on the widespread belief that you can only learn from personal experience. This experiment verifies something about human education which has been known and applied in the East for thousands of years and was applied in the West during the Middle Ages. The master has his apprentices. They learn from watching him and from being in his presence. Another traditional means of passing on the fruit of experience is a highly advanced form of story with many levels of understanding. Hundreds of them are about Mullah Nasruddin, a sort of oriental everyman. A film about him is in the making by Richard Williams. Here, Nasruddin is hauled before the king, accused of heresy. He has admitted going around saying such wise men as these are ignorant irresolute and confused. Nezrudin, you may speak first. May I ask the learned ones a question? Proceed. Oh, wise men, what is bread? Weird. Stupid question. <laughs> Go on. Bread is a substance which is for the purpose of nourishing people. Uh, it is, in fact, a food. Bread. Bread. Bread is a compound of flour and water mixed at a certain ratio and subjected to a certain heat. It is a blessing which descends 
is manna from the heavens. It is a gift from God, notwithstanding man's iniquity and undeserving state. Bread is a substance from which man draws nutriment. Throughout the ages, seventh and sages have sought the answer to this question. But still, it has to be admitted that nobody really knows. Your Majesty, how can you trust these men? Is it not strange that they cannot agree on the nature of something they eat every day, yet are unanimous that I am a heretic? Richard Williams has been living with Nasruddin for five years. With me, I was very... I just found them brain breakers. Did you remember yeah. when I was going around mm. heavily about it? And then I kind of just started to like them. And I found they pop up like people here. They say, oh, that's... Oh, good heavens. And then you'd quote the punchline. Mm -hmm. yes. Which relates to a situation. Anyway, yes. gradually, you like it more and more. Yes. Whereas first yes. thing you hear is a Mullah Nasruddin. Mm -hmm. What the hell Ever is that? that? Yes. Quite true. And then it just, mm. per, and then it, it is. It may be, you know. You don't get rid of it. You don't wear it out. No, that's, that's the, the extraordinary thing. thing about it. It doesn't you don't get, wear out. Why not? It has durability. Why not? People normally get fed up with jokes and yeah. wisecracks. And, and, and everybody says, you know, five years you've been working on mm. this thing. Mm. I mean, surely, you surely must be worn out. Huh? you can't stand it's the same fed thing up. every day. Mm. I say, never. Mm. I get worn out on a month, one month job, commercial mm -hmm. job or something. Mm -hmm. But never on a... It is very, very Not strange. Not on Nasruddin. I never get bored. The Nasruddin tales which I have published have proved their worth in ways which few scientists would have imagined. Dr. John Kermish specialized in choosing certain types of inventive brain for the American RAND Corporation. This is the original think tank pioneering new ways of thought to solve industrial, commercial and social problems. He made a textbook out of the Nasruddin stories. And the one which pops most readily into mind is the one which uh, I remember where uh, Nasruddin is uh, looking outside his house for his key or someone asks him what he's looking for and he says a key and then he's asked whether he lost it there and he said no he lost it in the house but there's more light outside so it's better to look there and uh, that's one which I, I tend to feel has a, uh, a fair amount of significance and, and um, since there are many people who are professional researchers people who are just uh, laymen who tend to seek instantly for the solution to a problem in the area which they're most familiar with, I think that this, this story points out the error of such ways. You're trapped in this room. There's a locked door behind you. You're not allowed to go beyond this line. Mm -hmm. The key to the door is there, mm -hmm. and you have these two short sticks. How are you going to get that key without touching the floor to get yourself out? In time, she may realize that she can tie the two sticks together with her clothing 
or with a string supporting the picture on the wall, a picture she hasn't noticed. But in a real-life situation, is she going to notice her own interests in time? During the years which I spent at the Rand Corporation, I always felt that the most valid thing that, 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 that Rand had, and its people had contributed to, to the, the field of research was the so-called interdisciplinary approach. That is, don't rule anything out when you're trying to solve a problem, because you never know where, in which discipline or in which area the solution may lie. The problem is to get this glass of water suspended over this bowl by means of these three sticks without spilling any of the water and without having the glass of water touching the rim or being above the rim. Do I understand that the glass has to be above the rim? It can't be below the rim? It can't be below the rim. It's all yours. How are you approaching it? Um, well, my first reaction is to try and do it from the edge. Yes. But I have a feeling that I'm going to be uh, thwarted in that. <laughs> None of these sticks are going to be the right size, aren't they? Another thing I can think of is if you could hook them over. But I don't think that's going to hold the glass. You overlapping? I'm not overlapping, but I'm not holding either. Can I keep playing then? Oh, yeah. And that's You're on the rim. Doesn't qualify. Doesn't qualify. Rim. How, where's inside? I have to be inside yes, this yes. inside edge. Yes, sir. Okay. And the only thing I can think is you're going to build a platform of some kind. Mm hmm. Maybe I can't build one. I don't know. No, you can. I'll tell you that much. It can be done. By making the wrong assumptions, the solution to the problem is made even more remote. Now, you want to know how it's done? Okay. Right? That's how it's done. Now, you are thinking only in terms of the rim, and not in terms of the possibility of this balance. Mm -hmm. Simple, isn't it? Simple when you know how. Confined thinking can actually be dangerous. Dangerous because, even although it may be logical, it may prevent you from knowing what a problem is. And it may also prevent you from knowing how to solve a problem once presented to you. I'll tell you a story. Once upon a time, there was an old man who didn't want his children, his three sons, to fall permanent victims to confined thinking. So when he drew up his will, he deliberately left a herd of 17 camels to these three boys with the instructions that the first son should have one half of all the 17 camels, the second son should have one third of the total 17 camels, and the third son should have one ninth. Well, of course, when he died and the 17 camels were paraded in front of these young men, they discovered they couldn't do a thing about it because two doesn't go into 17, three doesn't go into 17, and nine doesn't go into 17. So they wondered whether they could sell the camels, but that would have infringed the terms of the will. They thought if they cut the camels up, that would not only violate their father's intention, but it wouldn't be nice for the camels either. And thus they had only one thing to do, and that was to find a wise man who could advise them. After a lot of difficulty, they finally located a wise man. And he looked at the problem, and instead of trying to divide anything at all, he said, I shall add one camel of my own to this herd, making a total of 18 camels. Now we may proceed to discharge the terms of your father's will. Now I have here beans to illustrate the herd of camels. The wise man said, one half of all the camels go to the first son. There are 18. We therefore get nine camels here. Two, four, six, eight, nine. One third of the herd goes to the second son. Three into 18. One, two, three, four, five, six. And the third son was entitled to one ninth, which is two camels. One, two making a total of 17 and
leaving one camel, which happened to be the wise man's camel. So he took it back, returned it to his flock. Having satisfied the terms of the old man's will and having taught his sons something which the father had intended from the beginning. At times in our lives, we've all felt that life is rich in possibilities. But in our everyday life, we make elaborate preparations for misfortune. I consider, um, basically, as far as I'm concerned, pessimist. Pessimist? Yes, um, and anything which goes on from there um, is obviously better. Is that your philosophy of life? Well, I'm yes, told. I mean, if one is optimist, uh, one can, can uh, continually gets banged down and um, keeps uh, getting, let's say, banged on the nose, if you like. So if one accepts the worst, anything on top of that, it's pure bonus. I'm always optimistic about everything, and even when everything's going wrong, I tend to be forcibly cheerful, I suppose, um, because although things are going to be wrong for the while, they're always going to improve in the end. I tend to sort of fear the worst, you know, and hope for the best. I don't... Is this, um, to fear the worst, is this some kind of insurance against the worst Yes, happening? it is, slightly. Yes, it is, yes. Then, uh, I don't like to hope for the best, because then I think I'll be so disappointed if it doesn't come, you know what I mean? Does it work? Do you find it works, or do you yes. feel it works? Quite, yes, yes, I think I feel it works, yes. Quite often. further his own evolution by breaking psychological limitations. For years and years and years and years, the four-minute mile could not be achieved in running. Then somebody ran it in four minutes. How many people have run it since? Lots and lots of people. Did those people not exist? Was there no such physiology? Was their nutrition faulty? Or have they transcended their limitations because they know it can be done or because they think it might be done? What fascinates me about the Western world is that notionally and theoretically, limitations are there to be broken, but in fact, we get this constant accretion of pessimism, which effectively prevents evolution in this form going ahead. <laughs> Man is asleep. Must he die before he wakes up? 